Marco. Hey, good, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, good afternoon. We're good two afternoon. minutes into the yeah. afternoon. So, so uh, we we never get to talk about this, but you're in um, California, Pasadena area, right? And I'm here in Princeton. So, yeah. across the <laughs> technology is amazing. We can have conversations three thousand miles apart. Yeah, and th th this is good to do it, um, you know, consistently, right? The, the, there's continuity and yeah, so wonderful. Yeah. So what have you been thinking about? Oh my, so you see this Dodge painting behind me, it's called Brew Ridge. And I, I started this after the uh, heading um, wiped away uh, Asheville and other locations. And I heard from my artist friends there and, uh, some of the studios were devastated. And so whenever I pray, I I, I begin a series of paintings. And uh, this is a rather large prayer, <laughs> uh, seven by 11 feet. And um, so I've been thinking a lot about um, nature and and also, obviously, our, our time, uh, fragmented time and divisive time and um all that is going on in the world you know uh, but um i'm blessed to be able to do this here here in the studio yeah it, and as you know i'm somebody that believes that to paint is to pray mm -hmm. and there's something that happens there's an expansiveness of space yeah that happens in that and so much hope can enter through generative action mm -hmm. in the midst of praying over heartbreaking situations. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. And that may be some, something that the world has not connected, you know, prayer and art, but I, I've always felt like art was prayer. And I, even, even before I became a Christian, I, I, I thought of it that way, um, that there was something sacred in, working in the process and um we get to be part of that and um so it it doesn't fully make sense to just focus on yourself you know self-expression because that even though that made sense in terms of i suppose philosophical kind of this modernist you know um outlook of through through art we're expressing ourselves or creating a voice in in the wilderness as it were but um it always felt like there was this other thing uh flowing through and and so yeah art and prayer i i i don't distinguish between the two now <laughs> yeah and there is i mean there's such a tradition of religious art for so long that was mm -hmm. the purpose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the primary purpose of art was mm -hmm. for religious right. instruction and observance like right. it's part of a continuing tradition that we lost somewhere along the way somewhere and it's way. it's almost a reclamation yeah and and yeah right you you read people uh, like Rothko's writings or I just went to a show in New York of Ashio Gorky's uh work and I, I think they consciously connected spirituality with art and um, they knew how transcendence can break through uh, paintings and um, they have given themselves to that calling, you know, and, and so, so I, I don't, I don't know why it is so separated or um, e even with, you know, uh, brothers and sisters in the church right they 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 tend to separate you know art and faith um i wrote a book called art, art and faith but you know i um i i think that premise is something perhaps we need to oh there it is yeah um we we need to re-examine and see see if those two words are more integrated than people think yeah yeah um 
something that I've been thinking about and that um, David Brooks wrote about yesterday in his column in the New York yeah. Times mm -hmm. is um, this idea of cultural change. Mm -hmm. He was writing and building on the research of Taxia and Levin mm -hmm. and the idea that neither political party is casting a vision. Right. Rather, they're participating in ad hominem attack. Mm -hmm. And so building on the ideas of culture care mm -hmm. and moving towards culture creation mm -hmm. and reclamation, mm -hmm. how does the artist act as the visionary? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, and the two times that Hedgen and I spoke in the last month or so, one was called Painters, Prophets, and Poets, and the other one was uh, um, Artists Being Peacemakers. Um, they addressed what you just asked, and it, it's very interesting that people are asking these questions, and David Brooks, uh, you know, very keen observer of culture, and I, I think there, there is uh, not only a way that artists can participate in, let's say, prophetic calling of nations to um, bring about new renewal and vision to culture at large um, and lead the way in, in, in some sense globally, but also um, artists don't realize how much um, they are called on to wield this uh, visionary path of by integrating earth and heaven in a sense you know the, the materiality of what, whatever we do whether it be materials we use or our bodies or um, you know if you're cooking <laughs> your, your um, flour and and eggs, you know, I mean, those, those, those are tangible materiality of this earth, but great art is created when that is connected with the transcendent, right? And, and, and by transcendent, certainly it is the sense of transcendence now, but it is also connected to the future of what that transcendence can lead you to, uh, first of all, uh, us as human beings, but also collectively, right? Our communities and our, um, our, our world, our country. Where is that vision taking us? And, you know, where we don't have that vision perhaps in political dialogue, because it's been so decimated by cultural wars. Uh, cultural wars purpose is to demonize the other side and, and to um, reduce the other camp's argument by um, creating, um, basically creating toxins to speak against, right? So, so you're shooting yourself in the foot that way you, you're pouring poison into the very soil of culture that our children will have to build something upon and they can't because whenever you sow anything into poison soil nothing grows um so culture care as an alternative is 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 to see the soil of culture as um as as a good gardener would see it or uh you know we are uh stewarding the environment of culture so that means everybody is part of that sacred process of um taking care of the land and and seeing it as a gift from from the creator to make make it more productive and generative for future generations and, and beautiful. You know, we see this beauty today, autumn leaves here in Princeton are beautiful. Um, and and so there, there's an issue of stewardship 
um, of culture and as opposed to culture wars, which turns cultural soil into a battleground. Um, so there is a sense in which artists who lead the way in, in that because we, we are the, you know, border stalkers who, uh, who see things perhaps ahead of the tribal leaders, you know, hunker down in their own tribal zones. And, and we learn the language of the other through the arts. Um, we had developed this highly, highly trained sense of empathy and we're able to learn from the enemy, as it were, to, to understand the language that they're speaking and what they are concerned about. And we're able to translate that even if we disagree with what they believe, we can be a bridge to communicate that back and forth. And so that's certainly one great purpose of, of being an artist is, you know, we, we are free to meander and to roam the fields, uh, just like honeybees to try to find flowers that we can pollinate, right? And, and to make it productive. Mm -hmm. yeah and as artists we're privileged in that sense right mm -hmm. that yeah. we're so trained in observation yeah. and um like we're always moving the rubik's cube yeah. like we're always spinning the globe yeah. we're seeing everything from all sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how do we how do we bridge that so that others can engage in that behavior? Yeah, and I I just finished a manuscript for my next book with Yale after Art and Faith, and and it's all about that. It's about how an artist see the world, um, and how that is actually helpful for everybody. Um, and in a sense, when we were children, we were all artists. <laughs> And we lost that capacity to see the whole um, and 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 to focus on the particularity of uh, you know each rock. Um, we we tend to be in the survivor's mode, um, having blinders on, so we no longer stop to marvel at little things um, that is all around us all or even to look up at the sky. Um, there was this amazing aurora here <laughs> in Princeton, which I never expected to see an aurora in Princeton, but there it was. And and uh, we were at a gathering in Princeton and, and uh, Hedgen asked, how many of you saw, saw the amazing aurora last night? And nobody saw it. <laughs> and they were like, oh, we heard about it. but And, and we were like, really? Like, why? Right? Like all I had to do was look up, you know? <laughs> and um, now people may not have the feel that we have. So that was a sheer advantage that we have here. But but I, I wonder how many of us, you know, have lost the capacity for wonderment uh, to, to simply stop and look around, to look up. And artists are constantly doing that which may be disadvantageous, you know, if you're in a survival survival mode, um, people are wondering like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Stopping in the middle of the road, looking up. But, um, but at, at the same time, I wondered if in our current cultural malaise, you know, cultural condition of, uh, of fragmentation and divisions, people are so anxious about the future. And, you know, we, worry about the future without paying attention to the present. Because even the fragmentation, as we learn in Kintsugi, is even something that is broken is sacred. And we can marvel at, the, at it as, as, as we behold the shapes of the broken edges and as sharp as they may be, we can begin to look at that as an opportunity to create something new and more valuable than you know, what existed before. So artists are given this task and and um, inclination to 
be able to hold these things together and and see the world and uh, panoramic vision, you know, um, at the same time focused on uh, 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 what is in front of you. And so that, you know, I, I, I as I was writing, I, I, it made me realize, well, actually, everyone can do this, um, but we choose not to. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine who is an eye doctor, and uh, he said, well, actually, we have to learn to do this, to put blinders on. And it's very stressful for our brain. <laughs> like, if you can be like a child, you know, like me, artist, <laughs> you know, like kind of seeing beauty everywhere and and um you know i may be late to a meeting but <laughs> you know my mind is my mind is relaxed and and so when i do get to that meeting i have a perspective that other people say like how do you think of that and i, and I say well, well i should i i think it's kind of obvious to me but <laughs> you know um i'm glad i can contribute something you know um and and i think that's kind of what we need right now is all of us artists, first of all, to understand that we have certain giftings that, that is, you know, a way, a portal for, <clears throat> first of all, others to see and see the world through our eyes and through the lens of what we create. Um, but also that we can teach others to do this, to slow down, um, you know, at the Pepperdine show, um, uh, you know, Andrea, the curator, posted a sign, you know, you may not see these paintings for 10, 10 minutes, so pick a painting, sit in front of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how many people actually did that and reported that it actually opened up something in them that they never thought um, possible or they didn't see before and how heating that is, right? That's 10 minutes of our time uh, to pause, reflect, look at something and, and consider that. And, and so th these are things that I think culture care um, will advocate for and something that artists can uh, always do. And this kind of circles back to art as prayer, but Simone Weil said, attention take it to its highest form is prayer. Yes. You know, um, and in all of the like modern neuropsych discourse, there's also so much emphasis on mindfulness yes. as the antidote yeah. to the stress. Yeah. And artists are intuitively being mindful in their keen attention to things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Simon Weil's, you know, a, a, a highest um, atten attention is prayer. Well, art is paying attention, right? Being aware. Um, that's what art is. You know, you and I create objects, you know, and we call that art. But really, art is about that moment when we, any of us, is able to be aware, fully present in 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 that moment, and and through our senses, we are able to. Uh, both know the world and integrate that knowledge into what we make. So, so those those two things are happening simultaneously. Actually, when we we actually pay attention. So, you know, artists gazing into empty space is not wasting time. There's a lot going on in 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 the mind and heart, and artists is always creating something. We we're prone to create. So um, it, even if we seem to be, you know, um, lagging behind in some way, we, we, our gift is to pay attention, to, to hear, to listen, to uh, even feel deeply. Um, and we can intuit in a, in a room, something that is happening that we've been trained to. And, and this is what theater artists do very well. They they have to understand that the audience brings in their projection onto the stage. And, you know, their training is to intuit that, right? And and, and the same lines in a Shakespeare play, 
can mean very different things to different audiences. And, and so that kind of mindfulness is what artists always practice. And, and therefore, for a world that needs mindfulness, can learn a lot from artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the construction of objects and the construction of culture. And I wonder how you would articulate your hope for the vision that you present. Mm. Um, yeah, hope is a substance of things hoped for. I mean, a faith is a substance of things hoped for. And so hope comes first, I guess, right? In, in that uh, paradigm. Um, and hope is the, in a, in a sense, the substance of, you know, what makes faith possible. Um, and so for art, um, you know, because you can't really define hope in analytical ways only, right? So, you know, ho ho Emily Dickinson, hope is a thing with feathers, she says, <laughs> that perches in the soul. It sings the word without tunes and never stops at all. So that hope for her was not something that you define in a dictionary, but it is that bird singing outside of your window early in the morning. <laughs> and, you know, maybe it's a house rent, it doesn't stop singing, you know, it's, it, it's, it just keeps going and persistence of that. And, and I, I, I do sense that anything that is worthwhile to hold on to that leads to enduring reality is something that is very very hard to pin down and and you know even even create data around mm -hmm. and and that that's why i'm not <laughs> too uh well uh, there are concerns about you know artificial intelligence and deep learning and all that technology going on but I'm not too concerned that that would replace that, you know, ability to render something about hope, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, requires faith. And and these these two words, I I, I don't think can, you know, um, even as advanced as m machine learning and um, alg algorithm can become, um, they can execute very well certain things that we, we are certain of, but things that we look forward to, the hope uh, and having faith toward that, uh, I think it's only going to be amplified, that gap. And and so, so we as human beings need to even more so be interested in and work hard to capture that mystery of what you know is is impossible to define yeah and artists are sensing that um but maybe all of us need to sense that uh through the arts and participate in creative activities um so that we can enlarge the capacity to um, understand reality, capital R. Um, meanwhile, and, and, you know, enjoy what the machines can do. <laughs> Be amazed at them. Um, maybe, maybe we don't have to drive anymore. You know, <laughs> but but what do you do in the back seat? Right, we have all this time now, and we sh we should be thinking about oh, well, we have you know all this uh, gift of time to create things. So how do we bring the studio into the backseat? You know, how do we, um, that should be a concern. Yeah. It's the notion of living in the ephemeral, liminal, creative triangulation. Yeah, right, right, right. right. And it's, it's, um, it's something that artists have been doing, uh, you know, unconsciously, um, you know, since since the ancient days, right? We uh, we we take our tools, you know, like a brush, and we learn to 
create something with it. And the tools have gotten much more sophisticated, but it's the same principle. And it takes imagination, you know, to be able to paint an image that is enduring. Uh, so so it's, a, it's the same order of practice. Now, um, I think we, we are, have gotten to a point where the um, technology and, and the tools have become so uh, sophisticated that it can run basic functions that you know we used to have to uh, deal with. But at the same time, that gives us freedom, again, the margin space to explore the mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> so much possibility. <laughs> so much possibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And, and yet also, obviously, uh, like anybody concerned about the misuse of that, um, you know, we can make great art or uh, weapons of mass destru destruction, you know, and, and so in light of days, it was interesting, I'm going to write about this in the newsletter, but uh, two Nobel winners, right, one, one is a uh, South Korean um, author, Han Kang, who is a remarkable, uh, she's, she's like a modern Kafka, you know, she touches into this very uncomfortable realm and yeah, makes it ordinary, you know? And and then the other Peace Prize went to the, uh, this organization making sure that Hiroshima and Nagasaki memories stay alive, uh, representing the Hibaksha or the survivors of atomic, atomic bombings. And I, I couldn't help but to feel they were connected in some way. Obviously Japan has been very, very, unkind to Koreans, uh, that's a, a, you know, understatement. Um, and Japanese aggression over the years have perhaps even caused a lot of the tension, you know, global tension, uh, at least at the time. Um, but when you look at the two nations as, as a recipient of uh, suffering and it, you know the the invasions as well as atomic weapons. There, there's a common curse there, right? To to for both nations to deal with, and to create peace, you you have to look at the past and 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 the ugly things and and the things that uh, the nations have done wrong. As for the Japanese, that is clearly identifying the aggression um, of the past and addressing them. Um, but, you know, but, but, but at the same time, it isn't it amazing that we, we can pause in this very difficult, tense filled moment in America, right? To look at the past and say, well, that was um, whoever the cause is that's not you know that's not the point. The point is that reality of devastation, ground zero, um, reality of Korean mothers, you know, having nothing to live on. Those those realities have resulted in 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 this art, right? That that has come out, and those silence came out of Nagasaki, you know. So. So all these things, I think we can reflect back on and kind of have a long lens, you know, rather than just worried about November. Uh, we can say, well, there's been times when things were pretty chaotic and dangerous, and you know, and and hope hope less. Um, you know, people had anxieties and they they didn't know what the future will bring. And yet these, when you look back in history, there is art. There are people who stayed resilient and never lost sight of hope, you know? And, and so maybe it's time to look at them, 
you know, learn from them and and ask ourselves, go go to a museum and see a Frangelico and and ponder that this friar, Dominican friar, was painting during the Black Plague, <laughs> you know, and all these invasions happening and popes getting excommunicated. And <laughs> but here it is. There's this beauty, you know, that speaks to us, that led the way to the Renaissance, you know. So so what is our responsibility today and and how can we um uh, in coming together in community perhaps to encourage each other to to those paths yeah so much possibility <laughs> yes. it's really good it's encouraging <laughs> right like looking at all of that destruction and seeing all the goodness that gets created yeah yeah and also advocating for less destruction yes at the same time it's about peacemaking you know peacemaking is this active process of going through right through the storm to the eye of the storm and that takes courage courage to do and some, something that we need to help the next generation learn to do so, so good <laughs> thank you Marco Okay, Jay, good to talk to you. Bye.